sense of, I know the rubric was really, really specific, but I think most of you are, are doing what's asked. So, you know, um, especially if you're not having an example and not practice in this, in this class, I think you guys are doing a really good job. Um, I wanted to mention this though, because it was unclear to me if I was grading them and making comments, whether your peer reviewers would also make comments. So I've hidden the grades, but what that has done is hidden your final grade. So if you're curious about your final grade, you can just ask me and I can show you because it's now hidden on Canvas because Canvas is annoying like that. But either way, pretty good job so far. I'm happy with what I'm seeing. I uh, hope to get them done soon, but I won't release the grades till peer reviews are done just in case that does affect, I don't want it to affect my like, peer review process. So speaking of peer reviews, now that all the writing assignments are in, you should be assigned two peer reviews. If you're not, let me know and I'll manually assign you one. If you've been assigned one that doesn't exist, like it's just a blank thing, let me know and I'll sign you a new one. It's important to use two of them. And what are we looking for? About 100 words. So if you look at the instructions for the writing assignment, it says like 100 words. And it also says, um, you know, use the rubric. So in creating this writing assignment, the main central point was discussing science. So in your peer review, you can give whatever comments you want, but you should discuss science. That's what I'm looking for. So if you just did like one sentence, my like, great job, I can't give you full credit for your peer review. So make sure, if you've already done it, just make sure and go back. I, and some people, as I started going through, have already done peer reviews, and most of them are good. Some of them were just a little bit on the short side. So think about that. Okay, um, I'll jump down to finals in week 15. So week 15 is, like a half week. You have classes Monday through Wednesday, and then study days, whatever they call them, Thursday, Friday. We will meet normally on Tuesday. It'll be kind of cancer genetics and whatever else we don't get to in these next couple of lectures. So top hat, all that good stuff. On Wednesday, we will meet in discussion. It'll be a review session, but we will take attendance then because it makes the math work for all the drops that we're doing. Then you're, you're done, right? I'm hoping that everything graded by that Wednesday so that you know where you stand in the class. People have already been asking me, do I need to take the final? No, if you're happy where you're at, don't take the final. But I would say, you know, the goal of this last five lectures is to really synthesize things. So we've seen probability, we've seen DNA, let's start bringing them together. So I think if you're really synthetic, you might see um, this material on MCAT or Whatever, whatever, whatever else pre-health tests you're training for, um, you might see them in upper division courses here at UNL. I'm, I'm kind of covering things I want to cover, but also things that I've been told are good to cover in kind of a, a sort of level genetics course. So even if you don't plan on taking the final, I would still keep up with the material, just so you can kind of get that synthetic aspect. Um, so surveys, what I mean by that is course evaluation. I talk to people in the biology department, they say, oh yeah, everyone does an informal survey because the one that they'll send you is not very good. Still do the one that UNL sends you, but I made one on Canvas. It should be anonymous, and to incentivize you completing it, I want to offer extra credit points. So I wanted to get a sense, how many points do I need to offer to incentivize you to take this survey? So it's like some multiple choice, like where the draw to learn is helpful. Agree, disagree, blah, blah, blah. Some of them are like, you can type in whatever you want. How many points do you think? Five. Five? Well, that's bold, but maybe. What about, what about four? 4.5. 4. 5. <laughs> <laughs> I can do five. I'm willing to do five. That's a pretty decent chunk. I was, I was hoping people were just going to show on one hand. So if you can keep it to one hand. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so I will edit that. I will post the instructions on Canvas. Complete it. It helps me. It helps you. Five points, right? Okay. Any questions on any of those things? Peer review, this informal course evaluation or finals week slash the last week of course. So I will try to reiterate the peer review on Canvas. I'll make an announcement. It's due May second, so you have a little less than two weeks to get those done, and I'll post instructions for where you can find this course evaluation. Sound good? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna finish sequencing. Um, we got practice with it yesterday in discussion. We just wanna wrap it up because that's where we ended last lecture. And then we'll move into genomics. So genomics is, if we can sequence, what can we learn? So that's kind of the goal. It will go fast because a lot of it is not 
super important, but I will try to really stop when I think something's really important. So if you want to know what you're responsible for, I'll try to make that really clear and stop and answer the question. So this is kind of where we were at last class, and you saw this in practice yesterday. We can use the chemical nature of DNA, those three prime three hydroxyls, to manipulate it to make a new DN, a DDNTP, a dideoxy. It no longer has the three hydroxyls. Right? We care here. No hydroxyl. When these are incorporated into a DNA molecule, it's just a stop. And that's what you saw in these experiments. So you made a gel, right, as if you had done the experiment. So if you were going to sequence a, a template strand of DNA, you would end up with this. And so what's really important here is the template and synthetic strand relationship, right? So here's the template, which is what we given to you yesterday. And you're building kind of this complementary or synthetic strand. How are you building it? You're incorporating nucleotides, and then when you get to the nucleotide that matches whatever reaction you're in, right? So here, um, since this is stops on A, the adenine, right? So it keeps building the A molecules until it hits an A. It incorporates this dideoxy molecule since it's a stop. It has to stop because there's no three three prime hydroxyl. Then you run each individual reaction in a well, right? So this, all three bands are from the same reaction. But they separate based on size. So this is the way that I like to write them. I like to put the sequence on the right-hand side like your book does, just so you can, you can really think about the five prime, right? You have a primer, you're gonna build five to three primes, so the smallest fragment is at the bottom, right? This is the smallest fragment. Smaller fragments migrate more quickly through a gel. It has to be the smallest fragment because it's right next to the primer. It's only had a few nucleotides incorporated before synthesis time. So any questions on that? We've seen this, we've practiced it, so now we're gonna try to build on it a little bit. Is it solely based on like, mass, or does charge play into it too? Um, what do you think? Both. Well, why would charge play into it? All right, I'm just, I'm thinking of a different method. Maybe I'm not I'm not sure. I think you're thinking of protein, um, or maybe you're not. There's something called a 2D page gel yeah. that relies on size and mass. So this is mostly just mass. Most DNA molecules have the same charge, right? They have a five prime phosphate, it's negatively charged. The rest of the bases aren't charged, right? Anything that would be doing hydrostatic interactions with hydrogen bonding between base pairs, the rest of your phosphate backbone is all covalently bonded. There's no charge on this molecule except for that phosphate. The charge is the same. There are other ways to separate things. So proteins, what you can do is you can separate them by size this way, and then for mass, and then you can separate it by charge, so you get like two dimensions. Um, proteins have charge, right, because of the amino acids the, and the functional groups associated with them. DNA all has the same charge. So that's a good question. But, um, this would be called like one dimensional, right? It's just how far down you go. We gave it two dimensions um, because we're running multiple experiments in a, in a page gel you kind of load stuff here, and get separated this way, and then separated this way. Because of the two, that's why it's two-dimensional. Not important for this class, but a good question. So we don't have to read gels anymore. Uh, this is all automated. So instead of doing individual reactions in four tubes, we now include DD NTPs that have dyes on them. So this is what this gel is trying to show you. So we have four dyes that correspond to four bases. They're still incorporated into the DNA molecule the same way when it reaches that base it stops. Um, you have to do the reaction so that you're not saturating with these, so that you get extension past certain bases. So there is a little bit more stochasticity compared to the other methods. Um, but then you get these fragments, or you can just incorporate all fluorescent bases into the 
depends on which kit you're using. I think in this example, they're assuming you're incorporating all fluorescent lasers. And then a laser just reads what's coming off the gel. So there still is a gel step, or there's a step where you have to like read DNA, um, but you don't have to do the individual reaction. And this can get you, I don't know, maybe 200 to 300 base pairs at a time. There still is limits to size of molecules that we can kind of read and put them on. So this gets us like a gene, right? A part of, not even a gene, really. Maybe in fruit flies, half a gene. In humans, it doesn't even get you through an intron. So how are we gonna scale this up to sequence a whole genome? What are we gonna do to make this massively parallel? So I think we talked a little bit about it um, in discussion yesterday. We're gonna sequence lots of fragments of DNA. How can we make lots of fragments of DNA? We can digest DNA with restriction enzymes or other enzymes like PET. If we think we can only sequence about 200 to 300 base pairs at a time efficiently, let's we'll just chop up the whole genome into 200 and 300 base pair chunks. So that's what this slide is showing in your book. So there's a, some people I think yesterday were talking about shotgun sequencing. It's a, it used to be called the shotgun approach because you're like just spreading your effort across lots of different pieces of DNA, kind of like a shotgun that spreads little, right, BBs in a shell, maybe depending on your familiarity with shotguns, this metaphor might not go very far. So what do you want to do? You want to take a chunk of DNA, you're going to sequence it the same way. You have to incorporate a uh, signal. Um, so this is what's trying to show. So you, you would digest your DNA somehow. You're basically making fragments. But then you need to make sure this fragment gets to a unique place. So they have all these terms that we're not going to go into, but basically it's like a glass slide. You can think of it as like a glass slide. The glass slide has a little chunk of DNA sticking out. So you chop up some DNA of interest. You ligate onto it a complementary piece of DNA, it's a hybridist, right? We talked about how enzymes can make sticky ends. So you digest the DNA making fragments, and then you ligate what's called an adapter. So I think our bioinformatics representative is not here. That means I can say things that aren't really true, and I won't get yelled at. These are like sort of true, half true, I can tell you. You ligate an adapter, and this um, facilitates complementary base pairing with the slide, the glass slide. That's what's trying to be shown here. And this would be your glass slide. So there's a chunk of DNA now, a unique fragment of DNA at each little dot on this glass slide. And then you just do kind of like Sanger sequencing. You incorporate a nucleotide, and these machines, they do one at a time and take a picture. So each pixel is a chunk of DNA, and it flashes one of four colors each round of sequencing. So you just take, right, 300 pictures, you have millions and billions of DNA molecules on this glass slide, the computer just builds it up, right? It looks at one little pixel, green, green, red, blah, 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 but it's doing that simultaneously for all those millions of pixels. Does that sort of make sense? Is it kind of something you can visualize? It's almost identical to the Sanger sequencing, where there's a laser reading it, it's just doing it massively parallel. You're doing the whole genome instead of just 200. You are doing 200 bases, but you're doing that times a million, times 10 million, depending on the number of reads. So is that super important? Um, no, I just am trying to give you background. So what, what, we, what we do now in genetics, we don't often sequence single genes, we sequence genomes. And this is how we do it. It's the same chemistry that relies on just manipulating the chemistry of DNA. Okay. The only time you really see kind of this old school sequencing is for what's called uh, microsatellites. So I mentioned this last class, um, we can assign probabilities of like paternity or DNA matching a certain sample based on unique features that in an individual would have compared to another individual. So that's kind of called a DNA fingerprint, right? You can identify regions of the genome that have enough alleles that it's unlikely that I share alleles with you by chance. 
I would only share alleles with someone based on we have a similar heritage, i.e. Uh, parents, or some other reason. So this is all dependent on what are called microsatellites. So these are short tandem repeats. So we've seen tandem before when we saw duplication. So what is short? You know, that's kind of up to debate, but you know, you can think of it like this. So if this is the satellite, that would be kind of like one unit, and individuals might have different copy numbers. Some individuals might have four copies of this microsatellite. Some might have, usually we're dealing with like hundreds, but I'm just drawing it out like this. So that would be like one unit of a microsatellite and it's repeating. So you can detect this, the length of these by PCR. If you put a PCR primer here and here, and you amplify across this, you're going to end up with different sizes. So different alleles here. You infer this from different sizes of the PCR product. Does that sort of make sense? So if someone has five copies, they're going to have a larger PCR product than someone who has three copies. What's important, I said it, but I'll write it explicitly. There's many different alleles segregating in a population. So the allele frequency of an individual allele is low, and we'll see why that's important for probability. So this is something you definitely should be comfortable with, um, thinking about probability and how it relates to identifying samples and the probability that two samples are the same. So these are what the data look like. So this is from your book. You have individuals with different numbers of repeats, right? So here the, the repeat is uh, CA. So here the microsatellite is CA. So they draw a scenario. We have an individual with eight repeats and two repeats. So see how the primers are binding and they produce a different size PCR product. So it's the same primers, they're external to the microsatellite region. They kind of flank where you expect this repeat to occur. You amplify across this region and you get different PCR sizes. You can tell that on a jump. Um, oftentimes, telling PCR products that are similar in size is really hard on a gel. It's difficult because like the resolution, they look the same. It's hard to it's called resolution. They might look like the same size band because they differ by 10 bases. So this is a clear, obvious difference you can tell on a band, but oftentimes in a gel like this, but oftentimes the data look like this instead. And there's something else interesting that you can pick up from data like this. So on the x-axis, we have the size, size of the fragment. So similar to what we saw in that gel, and then on the y-axis is how much DNA is in it. And the way, the reason you would want to use data like this is that you can um, identify homozygotes versus heterozygotes. So that's what your book is showing here. You have one locus where a person's homozygous, a higher peak. Then, so this is one individual, probably many markers. So they're homozygous for the D8519 locus and the CSF1TO locus. They're heterozygous for the two other loci. Those two other loci are very small differences, right, in the, in the size, one's 24, 28. So you can understand that it's heterozygous because the copy number should be the same across the whole genome in the, in the sense of the, the amount of DNA, the 
fluorescence can be uniform across the genome, right? So it's almost like you know the fluorescence of these two. Kind of equals the fluorescence of the single pigment. Does that make sense? The signal you should get from any part of the genome should be the same. So you can tell the difference. It's almost telling a copy number difference, right? I have one copy of the 24 allele and one copy of the 28 size allele. So kind of add those fluorescence, right? It would look like the same part of the copy. Any questions on that? So it's really important that you can read this type of data. You can interpret it, and then you can do something with it. So these are some common markers in humans, um, commonly used in like forensic analysis. And so I wanted to show you this to think about how many alleles segregate the population, right? So the number of alleles in the US population for CFS one scale are 10. So what's the probability that someone is homozygous for a given allele? Let's say they're at equal frequency. They're probably not, so let's assume they are. What's the probability that you observe a homozygous for one allele at this level? Okay, let's take a step back. What would be the probability if there's only two alleles at equal frequency? So yeah, the probability, I, something's coming in on the chat. The probability of observing, say there's not just like big A and little a, but there's A, B, C, whatever, whatever, so the tenth letter of the alphabet. You want to see two of those. So seeing any one allele is one out of ten. Seeing a homozygote is the probability of that same allele, right? There's no permutation. That's a pretty low probability. Mm -hmm. So what would be the probability that two people are both homozygous? So the same allele. So this is the probability of one person. What's the probability of two people? Yeah. One out of 100 squared, right? You're multiplying. It's an and. Whenever we have two of n, this person is a homozygote, and this person is a homozygote. So it's one out of 10,000. That's a really low probability. So can you see how these are used in forensic? So this is assuming equal frequency, which is not true. Usually there is one common allele, and then a bunch of rare alleles. So this is an, like if they were all equally frequent, you wouldn't need a whole panel of low size to tell whether someone's the dad or the suspect or whatever. We'd only need one. But that's because often there's one really frequent allele and then a bunch of rare ones. But applying the same principle, you can, what's the probability that these two samples come from the same DNA source. You can do that. So here's our first question for the day. So here's three DNA samples. This is from your book, so they were calling them suspects. Um, is one of them more likely than the other? I think it's asking for a numeric or a word answer. So if you think one of them is more likely, you would put that. 
So not yes or no, the subject. So the bottom one is the sample from the trying team. So this is kind of what's the unknown. And then the top two are the ones we're comparing it to. You compare the bottom one to the other two. Okay, answers are coming in. Most of them are identifying this sample, right? It looks pretty similar. They have the same, they're both, so how would we talk about these data? They're both homozygotes, so the locus that's the, at 11, right? They're both homozygotes here, they're both homozygotes here, and they're both heterozygotes for the other two locus. Probability of that occurring is probably small, but that's the most likely match. So what information are you, how confident are you? Would you put this person in jail? What, what other data do you need? What other information do you need? So I'm opening the second question. I don't think we even have to get there, right? You don't get motives and alibis until you take a person to the precinct to interview them. You don't, we don't want to have to do that if we can avoid it. Eyewitness. <laughs> yeah, so I think most of the, most of the um, answers are circling on what we just talked about in the previous slide, so the allele frequency. Yes, there's probably a lot more information you need, but what I'm getting for in this slide is allele frequency. I cannot assign the probability that these two samples match unless I know the allele frequency. So when faced with a problem like this, think about two things. What's the genotype, right, based on the peak? Are there genotypes that are more similar? And then what's the probability of seeing these two similar genes. So use the allele frequency. Or I might ask you, if you want to be certain below like 1% chance, what do the allele frequency need to be? So you should be able to do that too. It'll depend on the number of loci, it'll depend on the number of alleles. The more loci, you need fewer alleles, and they can be a higher frequency. If you only have two loci, you need a lot of alleles that are at like intermediate frequency to make really good probabilistic statements about them. Any questions on this? So this is what really happens, right? This is also how people are exonerated. Like they go back, you made this conviction without actually doing the correct DNA test, or you don't know how to do statistics. Or probability. You never took a genetic poll. Okay, so this is just this last thing is just an example. We're not going to get really deep into the mechanisms of this, but it's trying to bring together a couple things we've talked about and trying to hint at where we're going after genomics, and that's gene regulation. So we previously saw small interfering RNA, SI RNA. That was one thing we talked about when we were dealing with eukaryotic genome regulation, right? There are sequences in genomes that make hairpins that are digested, the double-stranded small RNAs that can target based on sequence complementarity some region in the genome. We can make these. So this is just an example from your book that I thought was interesting. We can make a plasmid that has small RNAs. We can put that into an animal, 
or bacteria and make RNA. What what will that what does that effect have? So when you saw the discussion yesterday, and what you'll see next week is you know this is where we're moving. We're moving to trying to interpret data. You have all the tools you need, right? Like you guys in this class are scientists now. You have enough background information. You know how to read literature. You know how to comment on literature. The literature and scientific papers, right? You know how to make and test predictions. You are scientists. Scientists have to answer questions like this. Let's do an experiment. Let's inject some monkeys with these double-stranded RNAs, and let's see what happens. So this is the experiment they did. They injected these animals with double-stranded RNAs, um, and then they saw a, a decrease in um, cholesterol. So I think the different colors are different doses, and then the y-axis is cholesterol. So why did this happen? So step one, you inject Step two, you measure cholesterol. It decreases, so I want to know why. What did you do to this poor monkey? You don't have to know anything about cholesterol to answer this question. So what's the first step? What do you, you have to make a mechanistic connection between the data and a mechanism. So what's the mechanism here? SIRNA do what to transcription? Decrease or inhibit, yeah. They bind to DNA or RNA, they inhibit transcription. That's the mechanistic link we're looking for. You inject the monkey, you're decreasing transcription of a gene that's doing something with cholesterol. In this case, um, we don't know this, but in this case, they're actually targeting a gene called HOV. We don't need to know the gene. You can make a prediction, this gene is important for cholesterol metabolism, because if I inhibit it, I'm seeing changes in cholesterol in a particular time. So this is where we're going. This is like bringing all the skills you've been learning together. You have enough background information to answer questions like these. Any questions on this? You do the experiment, you see it, a result, and then you make a prediction. I predict that ApoB, or whatever gene is being inhibited, is involved in cholesterol. We kind of did that yesterday, depending on which discussion you were in with the polar bears, right? Mercury poisoning decreases methylation. That's the data that was collected. Then you can make a prediction. What's happening to XY polar bears? They're going crazy, right? They're expressing genes in the brain that should not be expressed in the brain. You make the logical link that DNA methylation inhibits transcription. So if you remove it, transcription goes up. Questions on that? Okay, so now we're going to transfer over to genomics. Your book has a lot of different terms. There's some really interesting parts. Like I said, it's going to be pretty quick. I'm just going to try to highlight what I care about, what I want you to get out of thinking about genomics. And we know how these genomes are being synthesized. Sequencing at a really large scale using all the techniques we described last class and just right now. Um, so this is from your book. People have been trying to sequence the tree of life for a really, really long time now. People think that genome sequencing is just going to discover things, right? If you sequence the genome of a platypus, you're going to know why it has a bill and um, a weird tail. That's not true. It just gives you a bunch of DNA. Right? If you sequence a bunch of human genomes, you're going to solve all diseases. That's not true. Um, you're just going to end up with a bunch of SNPs. But it's a very important first step. It tells you about evolutionary relationships, it tells you about genetic differences, and then you can functionally test them. So genomics is super, super, super important, but don't buy the lie 
that sequencing everything will solve all of our problems. So that is definitely not true. So what is the first, you sequence all these genomes, what can you do with this? Um, the first thing that you can do is just understand the structure of genomes. That's really important. Um, so structural genomics gives us the organization of the whole genome. Why is this important? We touched on this a little bit when we were thinking about chromatin. So why is where you are in your genome important for a gene? not homogenous. Chromatin, remember, is the interaction with the nucleosomes and DNA that can be packed really tight or packed loosely. Heterochromatin is packed really, really tight. That's non-uniform across the genome. So where you are in the genome might predict your expression level. Not for any reason of like transcription factors or regulators or anything, just physically where you are in the genome. Where do we see more heterochromatin? Sure. Um, I'd have to think through all of that, but I meant there's like four genomes. And one frozen in one place in time. Where will we see more heterochromatin? That's a centromere. We haven't talked about them hardly at all, but the telomeres too. Centromeres, we've talked about a lot. Telomeres, not so much. Things close to centromere are not expressed very much. So the other thing we can get out of structural genomics is um, mass. So I talked about this in my discussions. I think Dr. Drury did as well. We've seen lots of different maps. We've seen linkage maps. Now we can make physical maps. We can compare these two. And the really important thing that you should know, and we talked about in the discussion yesterday with problem one, is there's always a relationship, right? There's always a relationship between probability and distance on a map. We've seen in linkage maps, right? There's probability of crossover <laughs> that results in centimorphism, like a physical distance on a map. Yesterday, you saw the probability of a restriction enzyme occurring that correlates to a physical distance that you would expect between test sites. That relationship is really important. So these are what these maps look like. So this is a map of the human chromosome one. This is a linkage map. So it's based on what? Recombination frequency. Why is that important? We sort of touched on this when we were thinking about linkage mapping. If you have, it's very rare in human genetics that we know this gene is important for this disease. But what we might know is that there's a marker, maybe a microsatellite marker, that links to disease. So we want to know about recombination. There's a marker here, linked to disease. How many genes are incorporated in that? There's low recombination, it's like this whole thing is linked, right? If it's not, if it's high recombination, we might be able to narrow it down to a handful of genes. So recombination maps, even in the era of genomics, are super, super, super important. And here's a physical map. So this is um, yeast, chromosome 3. When someone says yeast, and they don't tell you what type of yeast, it's Saccharomyces. That's like the model genetic yeast. 
in small organisms with small genomes, you can actually compare the physical and the recombinational mass, right? So that's what's shown on the left and the right. There's more space or less space sometimes, right? Like between these two genes and the one mass, it looks like there's a lot of space. Here there's not. Because of that chrome, the centromere, and how centromeres kind of interfere with the combination. So you can compare them, that's really important. So all of this is structural genome. But how do you compile these? Right? You compile these by making contexts. So that's again what you did yesterday in discussion. Your contact was pretty small, um, but oftentimes you can't sequence your whole genome. So again, these are just examples, just to try to impress upon you why this is important. So this is the human Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is super heterochromatic. It makes sequencing the Y chromosome super hard. You can't even shear the DNA and access it because of all the heterochromatin. So what you end up with is tiny little chunks. You actually have to do an intermediate step. So gap here refers to a deep artificial chromosome. You cannot just take DNA from a human to the Y chromosome and throw it on a sequencer. What you do is you cut it up, you put it into heat through an artificial chromosome, and then try to sequence it. You try to grow so much heat that you're getting tons of Y chromosome specific DNA. Are those details important? No. The important part is context. Context are super important. So, what are some of the limitations of these maps? Really, it's about accuracy and resolution. So accuracy, what I mean is, you know, your map's only as good as your context. How many contexts you can make. If you have a lot of contigs, like you have a bunch of DNA that makes this contig, a bunch of DNA that makes this contig, but they have no overlapping sequence where you can join them, then you really can't order them in your genome. So that shared sequence is super important. And if you don't have a lot of it, you have a lot of little contigs, you don't really actually know much about your genome. Um, resolution refers to like the accuracy of bases throughout the whole genome. So this is really limited by um, how well you can sequence something. <coughs> so this is like that Y chromosome example. We just can't access it. We have really poor resolution and accuracy for the Y chromosome. So again, not, these details aren't super important, but hopefully they're just helping you think about genomics in a different way. This is the first genome sequence. It was a really big deal. Um, way before I was doing science, probably before most of you were born, right? 1995. Um, it's a bacteria. It's small enough, they know all the genes. Bacteria, you can actually do a lot of prediction about a gene function or like genome function from gene sequences that you can't do in these. So this was a big thing. So like, wow, we see all these genes. Cool. Paper. If now if you sequence the bacteria, people are like, I don't care. Move along. But it was a big deal because it's the first one. So this is just another example of context. Um, sometimes you cannot make context just based on physical maps. Sometimes the combinational maps help you. Like maybe you have um, so I'm just going to say a linkage map can help with a physical map. So I know in these figures in the book, they have like too many words. So that's the take home point. I might not have a good context that can link some of these genes together, but I know they're close together based on recombination frequency. I don't have any context that I can align them, but I, like, I know this is close. 
and this one is farther because of the linkage map that I built. So that's the take home point for a, a, a diagram like this. So what is a concept? We've been talking about it, you did it, just to kind of make sure we're all awake this morning, what is a concept? What would be your best definition? genomics was getting at structure, but it's also kind of by default, you're noticing when there are DNA changes. So nucleotide changes. Your book calls this structural genomics. I wouldn't call it that, but I'm going to stick with what the book saying. Some people really care about the structure of genomics. I don't. Like the, the animals, the slides that I work with, I don't care what the genome looks like. I care how it differs from one individual to another. I don't need to know the orientation of genes, I need to know allele frequency. So if you're doing nucleotide changes, instead of doing population genetics, which we've done in the you're now doing population genomics. Right, you're looking for signals of mutation, um, drift, selection on a genome-wide scale. So what are these nucleotide changes? They call them single nucleotide polymorphisms. I think I've said this word several times, SNP. I might have just thrown it out just because I'm used to saying it. SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism will change. Either you're a C or an A, a single nucleotide. These SNPs occur in isolation in a genome, or what else do you want to know about that? You want to know what SNPs occur together, right? Just like different genes, have different recombination frequencies, different SNPs have different, re between them have different recombination frequencies. So whether you, you often don't genotype a single SNP, you often genotype what's called a haplotype. You can get a nucleotide changes, you can get haplotype. This is really common in humans that have really big genomes, like all humans have really big genomes. So this is common in organisms like humans that have really big genomes, stretches of low recombination. So you might not see just one SNP, but like 20 SNPs in a big chunk, which is called a haplotype. So this is a set of SNPs. So this is caused by what's called linkage disequilibrium. So linkage. always see them together. They're not independent observation because they're never recombined. So this is what this looks like. So you have a SNP. So these, you're kind of looking at an alignment of different individuals. So 1A, B, C, D. Oftentimes in population genomics, we don't care about individuals, we care about chromosomes. So this could be like two individuals, four chromosomes. Or it could be a haploid chromosome for four individuals. It doesn't matter. If you're dealing with a large enough population, chromosomes and individuals, it doesn't make a difference. So you have SNPs. Those are the columns. But if you notice, there's a certain pattern, right? And you're seeing, you could see some haplotypes. This one's too small. Um, so here, each individual chromosome has a unique haplotype. That's very rare. Um, but this would be the haplotype. 
So if you sequence more humans, you might not just care about looking for the first C versus T SNP. You'll want to identify how many people have that full haplotype. So you deal with the frequency of that full haplotype. Questions on any of this? And I'm going to switch gears a little bit for functional genomics. So this is what the genome just tells us about its structure, both like in terms of physical structure and structure within population. But what does that mean about how the genes are expressed that give function, right? That make enzymes, make proteins, do metabolism. We can learn about that through genomics as well, sometimes. So you want to characterize what the sequences do. Any idea on how we can do this? If we have a gene from a genome, we don't know what it does. What are we, how are we going to determine that? Think back to your phylogenetics super, super short lecture. If I have a random gene, is there anything I can do to determine the function of this gene? So what did we talk about phylogenetics? We talked about clustering things, organisms, genes, based on sequence similarity. So if I have a random gene and I don't know what it does, I can pull out genomes Say, okay, say I know it's from mouse, but I don't know what it does. I'll go and I'll pull out genomes from, a, from rats, humans, cows, pigs, vertebrates, mammals that have really good genomes, and then I'll make a bunch of phylogeny. Whatever this gene is most closely related to will pop into the phylogeny of closely related genes. So if I know if this mouse gene is unknown, but it clusters in a gene genealogy of phylogeny, with genes of humans, pigs, and rats that are involved in blood clots, then I know this gene probably is involved in blood clots. Right? You can characterize what sequences do by homology. That was our like super important thing when we did the building of like the phase phylogeny. We were looking for homologous sequences, sequences that were shared derived characters. That's super important in genomics. You can't really do genomics well if you don't do evolutionary biology work. Um, you can sequence what's called the transcriptome. So if the genome is kind of like all the genes, what do you think the transcriptome is? Yeah, I think someone said something like that. All of the what? Yeah, all the RNA, all the transcripts. We don't always have to sequence the genome. You can sequence the products of the genome, the transcript. You can sequence RNA. You can get inserted into DNA. And we'll talk about that. That's really, really important. And then the last thing you can do is the protein. So what's going to be that? If you know that proteins are being produced by a genome, you have the genome sequence, you can find out which genes are producing those proteins, right? Proteins have amino acid sequence. That is a product of translation. That is a product of transcription that came from somewhere in the genome. So it's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, but often if you know the sequence of a protein, amino acid sequence, you can find where it came from in the genome. Not 100%, but it, it happens. So this is all really, really based on um, relationships, though. So evolutionary relationships. You have to think about homologs, orthologs, paralogs. I'm not going to define these because these are the quicker questions. I think they were in your reading. And then we'll talk about them. 
So what is the difference between an orthologue and a paralogue? So homologs, just the broadest term, things that are identical by descent or shared evolutionary relationship. So that definition you hopefully know, but what is an orthologue and a paralogue? Equal frequency, we have like 40 out of 50 of you have answered. Equal frequency, um, no one answered this one. This would be our, kind of like a throwaway one. That doesn't tell you how they're different, really. So what do you guys want to rule out for some of these other ones? Any thoughts on what we can rule out? Yeah, we can rule out A. They're both different types of homologs. It's just going to depend on where they are in the genome. So we haven't really used the term analog, analogous, right? That's, that's not a functional, that's not like a term that we've used to describe relationships yet, or, or will. So we can rule out A. So now we're down to C and D. They're both kind of just like a flip, right? So if you answer C or D, um, that's great. That's what we're just trying to look at. We're trying to get you to think about homology. So we have a defined difference, but the best answer is E. Orthologs are genes in different organisms that are closely related. Paralogs are genes in the same, or in the same um, organism that are closely related. So can you predict or give a mechanism of how paralogs arise? How do we get paralogs? Orthologs are just evolution, right? There's a speciation event, gene A and species one, gene A and species two. They might accumulate differences over time. Nothing special really happens. What happened to give us, in a single species, gene A1 and gene A2? Duplication? Yeah, a duplication. Paralogs are often the product of gene duplication or chromosome duplication. But if it's within a lineage, those are the ways we get chromosomal mutations, right? Deletion, inversion, duplication, translocation. Duplication generates parallels. So this is the example of this from this, um, these fish. You have an ancestral fish that undergoes gene duplication, right? So here, A, these two are now parallel. Then you get speciation. So splitting, and then you get evolution. So what's interesting is that here, A1 and A2 are parallel. B1 and B2 are parallel. But then these are orthologs. Same here, these are orthologs. So the parallels are within a lineage, the orthologs are between lineages. Does that make sense, sort of? Okay. So let's talk about RNA sequencing. So you can use this to determine the expression of genes throughout the genome. Does this chunk of DNA function? You know, that's hard, maybe it's a regular version, it should be more specific. Does this chunk of DNA make an RNA that might make a protein? Yes, I'll sequence the RNA. So you can get function there. What's also really important is you can get exon intron boundaries. How do you get exon intron boundaries?
what's this picture going to look like in the RNA? Is it clear what I drew? I drew like a chunk of DNA, the boxes are exons, the lines are introns. I'm asking you what will this picture look like in RNA? You did this in discussion. Yeah, all the exons. All the introns are gone. The introns should be boxes. The introns are removed, right? That's part of RNA processing. So in a mature RNA, introns are removed, you're left with exons. So if I compare an RNA sequence that I sequence to a DNA sequence, I can identify introns. I can identify those exon intron boundaries. That's really, really important. So how do we go from here? In your, in your, we're, we're trying to go backwards, right? In a cell, this is transcription. But we can't sequence RNA itself. Like we know how to manipulate DNA to sequence it. We can't sequence RNA. We can't really go back to genomic DNA. We can't recreate introns magically. But what we can do is we can turn this into what's called cDNA. So this would have a polyase there. This would just be back to normal DNA. We still don't have introns. That's okay. It's called cDNA, a complementary DNA. I think this is the most important two slides in this lecture, which means this is going to be on the exam. How do you make cDNA? How do we make any molecule? We need template, we need DNTP, we need an enzyme, we need primer. Right? The template is going to be the RNA. The nucleotides are going to be the nucleotides we shove into a tube. <coughs> we need an enzyme. We need something that's called reverse transcriptase. It's doing the opposite of what transcription usually does. Instead of using DNA as a template to make RNA, <coughs> we're taking RNA and making a template to DNA. Same exact process. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. We slap on a primer and then an enzyme along it. We've seen that kind of over and over and over again. We just need a new enzyme. We need DNA or RNA reverse transcriptase. So the complementary, right, it complements. We're making a DNA molecule that complements the RNA. So there's going to be a picture from your book. So that's why I'm not drawing any pictures. So there's going to be a picture coming. But what are we going to use for a primer? So remember, we're not doing single genes anymore. We're doing the whole genome. We're doing all of the RNA that we can extract from the cell. So what are we going to use for our primer? We don't want to just give it one sequence. Well, that might be misleading. What can we give it so we do a reaction with all the RNA in the cell? I've given you a hint. I've drawn it on the picture. Any ideas? With the enzyme? The enzyme? Uh, the enzyme will extend off of this primer. We need a primer. So what is our primer going to be? So we talked we need template, we got that RNA. An enzyme, we need a primer still. We can't do this experiment without a primer. Is that the poly A tail? Say that again? The poly A tail? Yeah, exactly. All of the mature RNA are going to have a poly A tail. So if our primer is this, PTPTC, it's going to complement the poly A tail, and then we can extend and make a new DNA molecule. Yeah. You can also use things called random hexamers, where you just put six bases randomly and you shove them all in. But if you want to get mRNA, mature RNA, you give it a string of keys, so that has to bind to the poly A tail. And that's your primer. 
So this slide and the next slide, two most important slides of today. So this is what it looks like. So the top you have RNA, right? So they just skipped this step, so I'm going to draw out the steps here. We have our mRNA. I'm just going to give it a very small sequence. And then it has the poly A tail. So I'm going to draw up until here. The rest of it is just genomics, which we've already seen, because you have DNA already. I'm just going to draw like up until that line. We have this mRNA. Now we add our primer, right? So this would be, right? The poly A tail is free prime. Mm -hmm. It's a single stranded thing. We add our primer. Primer. And then we're going to extend this way. Right? We're going to build five to three prime. Even though it's a reverse transcriptase, it's going like the opposite direction in terms of from RNA to DNA, it still has to build on a three, a three, three prime hydroxyl. So what are we going to end up with? Now we're going to end up with a DNA strand that looks like this. first strand of our complementary DNA. And then a normal DNA enzyme will come and finish it off. DNA doesn't like to be single-stranded. So that would be like cDNA, but it's really a double-stranded molecule at the end. Reverse transcriptase can only make the first strand, so single-strand synthesis. And then you have to put another enzyme to do the synthesis on the opposite. Does that make sense? Is that kind of clear? So once people found an enzyme, like people knew theoretically how to do this forever. They just needed an enzyme. They go pillaging different bacteria, they find an enzyme. Wow, this bacteria can make DNA from RNA. We'll take that protein, synthesize it in the lab. We can now make DNA from RNA. So the rest of it's just the same. You sequence it. Exactly the same. So this is just sequencing like we saw for genomics. You make those adapters, they uh, bind to an adapter on a glass slide, basically, to a complementary base pair. It's happening in millions of pixels. Boop, 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 boop. RNA sequence. You still have to build contigs sometimes for RNA, depending on how big the RNA molecule is, but you're not going to assemble a genome. You're going to assemble transcripts. So you still have contigs. But whereas the goal in a genome sequence was to make contigs into chromosomes or as big of chunks as you can, these contigs just re represent transcripts. Okay, so that's what the bottom is like RNA transcripts. We are talking about mRNA. We're dealing with a poly Is that clear? So the part that you have to remember is the part I drew. Primer, reverse transcriptase, single trans synthesis, and normal synthesis. Okay. Don't have a ton of time left. The rest of this is super important. But we'll just go from the Your book talks a lot about recorders. They're just kind of cool. You can put stuff in the genome that glows fluorescently dreamy. Um, we can target it where we want if you know the genomic sequence. So after doing all this functional genomics, okay, I sequence this RNA, but where is it in the genome? Like I know that there's a promoter. I want to understand where this promoter is causing this RNA to be sequenced. We just put in a fluorescent molecule. We stain a brain. Wow, it's in certain neurons in the brain. It's pretty cool, right? This is happening so much more quickly now that we have really high scale parallel genomic sequencing capabilities. Um, for a long time, if you wanted to do genetics with mutants, you'd have to wait around for a mutant. Like, man, I hope this mutant comes along. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. 
you just dose a bunch of flies or fish or mice with really nasty chemicals like gamma rays or EMS, you make a bunch of yeast. So instead of waiting around, you make a whole swarm of yeast. Then you phenotype them. I care about mutants that have whatever phenotype that you care about, and then you sequence them. You identify the mutations that are shared. There will be lots of mutations in the genome when you know these fish with EMS, but you care about shared mutations. So if you find 20 mutants that all lack dorsal fin, you sequence them all, and they all have the same mutation in a single gene, that's so strong evidence that that gene controls dorsal fin development. Right? You don't have to wait and breed fish and hope one pops out with a dorsal fin, or just like make mutants randomly. You can just do cool experiments like this. Um, people do this a lot in bacteria, which is really cool. If you want to know, if you want to identify um, bacteria that are um, let's just say helpful for gut microbiota. You make a whole bunch of mutant bacteria, you shove them into a mouse, then you see what comes out the other end, and you sequence it. You can tell from differential sequencing which bacteria were helpful or harmful to this mouse. So how do genomes evolve? Um, really quickly, prokaryotic genome, There's kind of a relationship between genome size and the number of genes, right? We know prokaryotes often organize their genes, genomes in operons. They're really compact. They do that for cellular efficiency and replication. So if it's a bigger genome, it's often maintained by selection. What's really, really cool is that there are bacteria that are called endosymbionts. They live inside other cells, so like aphids, have bacteria called Zygmera. Zygmera have super small genomes. They don't need to live in the wild anymore. They just need to live happily in this little pocket near the ovary of an aphid. They've lost like, I think, 40% of their genome. So it's not maintained by selection. So these are just numbers from your book. I told you the relationships, so we're not going to do that. I'm just trying to catch up so we don't fall too far behind. What about a eukaryote? There really isn't a relationship. It's really interesting. There's no relationship. That's because um, transposable elements and microstats are more common. You have transposable elements in bacterial genomes. They're not super common. The human genome is full of them. So people often think like, um, complexity, right? A more complex organism, which is not a real thing anyways, means more genes. But this is false. Oftentimes, more complex organisms don't have more genes. They just have more different transcription factors that can express things in different places. So maybe it's more protein. But what we've seen through differential splicing, right, you can get lots of proteins from one gene. So it doesn't matter the number of genes, it matters the transcription factors, the splice sites, how you can make these proteins. So we've got all the sequencing, we know everything about humans, right? You know, we, there's more than like a third of your genome that we have no idea what it does. Sequencing can only get us so far. Okay, next week, uh, epigenetics, developmental genetics. Discussion problems are already posted, so you can start looking at them.